All right. Welcome back, folks, for another episode of The Unplanned Show, where we talk about things that are unplanned, uh, potentially disruptive, and how do we deal with these things. Uh, with me today is Donnie Burkholtz, uh, uh, esteemed uh, analyst um, in and around the DevOps space for a long time. Um, I think I've been following you on the, the Twitters or whatever we're supposed to call it now, um, you know, for, for a decade or more. Yeah, just about um, since I was Twitter. <laughs> right, back when we used to call it Twitter. Um, and so really excited to, to kind of pick Donnie's brain a little bit about, um, you know, he's been digging in on, on sort of the, the platform experience side of things. Uh, and and uh, he and I had a good conversation. So a couple of weeks ago that I'm gonna, I wanted to bring onto the show. Before we get into that, I just wanna cover a few housekeeping items. Uh, we do have a couple of upcoming episodes uh, planned, yes, ironically, for the unplanned show. Uh, today we're, we're with Donnie. Next week is a holiday in the U.S. Um, and so we will not be broadcasting on Monday, September 4th, but we will be back on September 11th with Jason Flint uh, to talk about uh, crisis response management just in time for Global Preparedness Month. Uh, and since I know that's only one more episode of the Unplanned Show, I thought I would just share a couple of other upcoming live streams in case that just wasn't enough uh, to, to look forward to. But tomorrow, uh, Mandy Walls will be on with a couple of members of the Process Automation and Run Deck product team, 10.30 a.m. Pacific time, talking about the 4.16 release. Um, and then on September 6th, I will be on with a colleague of mine, Min Tran, um, joining the AWS Howdy partner. I realize, I don't know what the at was supposed to be um, in that, but uh, that's going to be over on the AWS Howdy partner Twitch stream. And uh, Vin and I have been working on a, a really interesting uh, demo with AWS SageMaker and bringing the operations cloud to life with that. So. That should be a lot of fun. Um, Donnie, before we dig in, I do, you know, we were we were just, uh, before we went live, talking a little bit about a very important seasonal topic, um, which is uh, the sort of the coffee beverage options. I often ask people if they're kind of coffee or tea drinkers, but you reminded me about this sort of seasonal phenomenon that is the pumpkin spice latte. Um, and there's also uh, there used to there there was a hot minute there when like Starbucks and Pete's, which is one of the kind of Bay Area uh, native uh, coffee chains, um, they were doing like a spicy uh, mocha. It was kind of like the Mexican mocha, mm -hmm. um, and they would sort of like offer it up until Dia de los Muertos, um, and that was kind of my go-to. I, I couldn't I couldn't quite get on board with Team Pumpkin Spice Latte. Yeah, but... so we, we can't get the Mexican here in the Midwest where I live because nobody can handle spicy anything. Uh, you know, you like drop a flake of red pepper in there and they're like, oh, I can't do that. Yeah. Well, it just has to look at a cayenne pepper and then it's mm -hmm. like sweating. So that's um, I understand. But yeah, that I that's the one that I want to come back. But I feel like I'm with a very small minority out there. I mean, there are dozens of us, dozens. Yeah, no, I love the the variety is what makes it interesting, right? Like the overly sweet thing, it's kind of sickening at some point. Like everybody got into it, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago, but now it's like, where is the variety? Variety is the spice of life. Yeah, yeah, every year, like show me something new. Um, okay, so, but is it is it fair to say you're you're on kind of team coffee, but please don't make it sickening like sweet. I am on team black coffee. With okay. uh, with one Splenda, please. Okay. All right. All right. Just a little bit off of basic. Yeah. Um, I got okay. on that boat. Uh, I don't know about 15 years ago, and I started losing weight, and I realized I'm having these like 600 calorie drinks like once or twice a day, and somehow that makes an impact. <laughs> you ran the numbers on that, and you're like, okay, maybe we're gonna just uh, stick with black coffee. Exactly. Um, okay. Well, you know. Uh, this is always just a good baseline uh, to get to know people, whether you should be bringing a, a coffee or a tea to that to that next meeting. Um, so we were we were talking a couple of weeks ago, uh, you know, your your um, your firm is digging into kind of the sort of the notion of like these platforms that really do help accelerate a lot of DevOps practices, 
Um, but there's kind of more to it than just like, you know, hey, you need a platform. And you had some great insights into sort of what's working, what's not. Um, and you brought up ITIL and some of the sort of changes recently in ITIL. Um, and I wanted to start there because at least level set, because I am not an ITIL expert. I hear it kind of muttered under people's breath about, you know, <laughs> you know if they're hard, hardcore on DevOps, it's like, oh gosh, you don't want to be doing that. But it's also like, when you zoom out and you look at where are most people in the world, how are they operating and managing large IT environments? Like this is a really common thing. So if you could just start by level setting for assume, you know, uh, for a lay person, right? What is ITIL and what, what's new and changed there? Yeah. And I, I think the best way to level set people is just to sort of walk through my own story and my own experience with this, um, which is that, you know, I've been a DevOps person since before we called it that, like back in the days when CF Engine was the best we had. And, you know, we were automating infrastructure with that. I was working on Gen2 Linux at the time, uh, you know, still around, but I've, I'm past my prime with that at this point. And so, you know, I kind of grew up in the open source, innovative startup world. And I'd heard about ITIL and I was like, you know, everything I heard was like, oh, that sucks. And why would we ever do that? And that's crazy stuff that only like some weirdo old, probably dying company would do. Um, but then, you know, after doing that, advising companies, you know, mostly startups and vendors and sort of leading edge end users for a long time, I ended up joining a company to uh, more of an enterprise side kind of travel tech company to, to lead their DevOps transformation. And after I joined, well, two things happened. One was that I realized I got the cool stuff that I wanted to lead, which was sort of that platform engineering group and all the developer experience, um, software and, and teams and everything. But I also got to take over these ITIL process teams, um, right? Like there's an incident management team and people kind of get that. And then there's like a, an event management team, like a configuration management team. And you're like, configuration management, like, like Puppet or Chef or Ansible or something? No, no, this is different. This is a whole different thing. This is, and, and like these teams of people who do things that you're like, why does that exist? Um, why is that a thing? Why, why would you possibly need that? And I also had the internal IT service desk within my group. And so, you know, like who you call when you forget your password and your computer breaks and you don't think of like unplugging and plugging back in or rebooting it or that kind of thing. Um, and so I had these, these groups that I was, I was thinking, all right, I've got the cool like DevOps group that's going to be awesome. I've got this other group I'm sort of familiar with. We'll modernize that. And then I have this group that I have no idea um, what I'm doing at all with. And we'll just kind of pick that up and, and figure it out. And it ended up being super interesting. And to bring it back to ITIL, so we had the groups like... Um, ITIL process names are the groups, right? So configuration management, what does that mean? Well, um, at this company, that meant like tracking all of the information about everything called a CI, which is not continuous integration in this world. It is a configuration item. Uh, and each configuration item might be like a server or it might be an application running on a server or it might be a binary installed somewhere. It's like a thing, any sort of entity would be a configuration item. And you're like tracking all this information about it. How do you track that information? By hand, there's like a team of people who like goes and gathers this information and like types it into forms in these ITSM, IT service management um, software suites, right? Like the service nows of BMCs and HPs and IBMs and all, all those sorts of, you know, things that have been around for a while um, that most large enterprises have. Um, and so I got there and like, why are, we're doing this stuff. Why are we doing it? This feels crazy. Um, but then it started to click after a while mm. because um, things would happen like you would have a major incident. There'd be a, an outage with a service named whatever, right? XYZ. Service XYZ, major incident. How do you know it's a major, major incident? Um, you would often learn the worst possible way, which is your customer is telling you mm. that there's a problem rather than you being able to identify it proactively and fix it before too many people ran into an issue. And so we'd hear about an incident because some of our customer support reps would get a ton of phone calls. They'd start to connect the dots within their management team. And then they'd call us up, the incident management group, and say, wow, something is really wrong here. You got to get on this and figure it out. And so if they call you up. That's taken you know, probably uh, 20, 30 minutes to recognize there's an issue, call you up. You start to go dig into it, figure out what's the impact. Monitoring is not good enough to really understand the business impact of that. Um, and then you have to figure out like, 
So who do who do we call? Right, we're the incident commanders. We can't actually fix the problem. Who do we call? Who do you call for service X Y Z? And if you don't know, that's a big problem. And so you'd have to figure out who do you call when you've got all these services. You've got a complex environment. There's not just like one major thing. Some microservices that are sort of all owned by the same couple of teams. There's like hundreds of services. There are thousands of people who are involved in building those and operating those things. And you got to find one of them out of that thousand plus people to call right now. Yeah. Sometimes there isn't an on-call rotation to find for those people. And so it kind of boiled back to this team of, of people manually entering information by hand for service by service. Who is the service? What are the dependencies? What's upstream? What's downstream? And who owns it? And then if they don't have an on-call rotation to find, you call up the lead of that team and they get to have fun dealing with it or delegating it to somebody else. Uh, guess what? Sometimes they don't answer because they don't have an on-call rotation, so they weren't expecting this. Uh, and so they sleep through it. You maybe just randomly pick another name out of a hat on their team. They sleep through it. Maybe you get the third person. Right now you're 45 minutes into this major incident and you still have nobody working on fixing it. Yeah. Right. It's not. It's not just that it's not remediated or not resolved or not worked around. There's nobody even working on it yet, and so all you've been able to do thus far is identify there's an issue and come up with a customer response that says like we're on it. But you can't say we've identified a potential cause. We've started to make progress toward it. Just we're on it. We're working on the impact and we're finding the right teams. Um, right. The worst sorts of mealy mouth excuses that you ever want to come up with. Um, and so that sort of that sort of scenario is the kind of reason that you have these um, structured processes like ITIL to help you track down the right team at scale, both in terms of all the services, but also in terms of all the different people who might be involved and get somebody on it to figure it out and fix it. Right. Same thing is true with like monitoring events. I mean, how many monitoring events are you generating that are somewhere between warning and high security alert. Um, you got to come up with all of those events and then assign them to the right service somehow because they're all being generated by central monitoring tools. So you got to assign them to the right service and then you, you got to get the right team on it. Um, you got to be able to figure out, is it this high level service or is it one of the underlying dependencies? They're owned by different teams too. Um, and you don't want to be waking a bunch of them up and then trying to diagnose it and figure it out. And then inevitably it always ends up being uh, either network or DNS getting the blame of course. Uh, and then they have to like push it back somewhere else and be like, no, that's not us. You just don't understand networking um, back to you. Um, so that's kind of like the root of the ITIL thing is how do you, how do you do this in a really consistent way at scale, both in terms of services and people. Um, now what that turned into is heavyweight process. Um, unfortunately, because a lot of organizations were trying not to reinvent it. And so they just adopt a book. They're just like, give me the processes, please. Like whoever it is, you know, if, just give it to me. And so they came up with this thing called ITIL. They said, here's the processes that are the default. Um, we encourage you to change those. People don't read that much. They just want something to run with and go. Yeah. Um, and so that, and that was kind of the root of a lot of the problem um, with ITIL and why it's disregarded. Another big cause was that um, it didn't get updated for a really, really long time. Um, like it was updated, Latham was in 2011 when they updated it, right? They probably spent a couple of years writing the update. So let's say 2009, that was like shortly after the sort of famous talks about deploying multiple times a day at Flickr, that was 2008, I think. Uh, and so they were, they hadn't even like heard about DevOps. Agile was even still pretty new in like enterprise companies at the time. Um, nobody was even talking about Lean really. So none of those concepts made it in. Then it got left to rot for like uh, six to nine years before it really got the next update when things were changing so fast in technology. And so it turned into just like, why, why do we have this thing over here when everybody doing it right is doing this thing over here? Yeah. But there's still organizations out there who are depending on it, right? Like if they're not, not everything has really been touched by the, hey, if you're doing it right, you're doing it this way. Um, is that, that's what I'm kind of hearing? Yeah, 
And like, especially if you look around now at places that will call themselves an ITIL shop, you know, typically they're very conservative. They're usually under some kind of regulatory constraints, um, right? It's going to be banks. It's going to be insurance companies. It's going to be um, healthcare companies. It's going to be governments. And those companies will still be hiring people in roles that sound like, uh, uh, you know, like event management manager or, you know, configuration management coordinator or um, they still have cabs, right? Change advisory boards. Mm -hmm. And they're hiring like a change management director um, to lead the change advisory board process because all changes in the production are like, manually scrutinized by this group of people who we know the research, right? Um, led by, you know, Nicole Horsgren and, and, and others, right? That says cabs suck and peer review is way better. Um, and it provably better, not just faster, but higher quality. Um, and yet, you know, I till old, I V3 have not caught up with any of those things. Um, and so it's just like, it was stuck in the past. Companies are still operating like that. Even those big companies that are I shops, they haven't, um, they haven't internalized the V4 stuff yet, which is all about how do we pull in Dev DevOps, how do we pull in Agile, how do we pull in Lean, how do we think about value streams instead of um, process orientation. Um, they're still very early in that process. And so yeah. they're they're on like the DevOps ship, if you will, but they haven't they haven't really combined the two because um, it takes a long time for any sort of change to get adopted by these large conservative organizations. Um, and so th it's just going to take some time to get there. Yeah. So you kind of, you had this sort of epiphany, right? You were sort of like, Hey, DevOps is, is there's, there's a better way, to, better way to do this. You go into an enterprise um, you've been consulting in DevOps, go into an enterprise. You're like, Whoa, what's all this ITIL stuff. Then you're like, okay, I see, now kind of why folks are doing this like but then now where where did you go from there right like what's kind of how's your thinking changed about what's the future of of itil and devops and how do these things kind of come together and how do you help sort of whether it's accelerate the movement or, or just mature where people are yeah and I, th I think the my realization was a couple of things one is that you're not going to convince these groups to go along by telling them everything they've been doing for their whole career is worthless um, and they all suck and they're terrible and their jobs should not exist. Um, that's that's a failed approach to change management in a large organization. Um, and yet that's the default approach that a lot of people will take, right? They're, they say, they'll say like, hey, I'm getting hired in from like a Bang or Monaga or whatever company, or I'm getting hired in from startups. Like I'm here to just totally transform stuff and, and turn it all around. But then they go about it the wrong way which is, um, you know, saying every, everything sucks and everybody's wrong instead of figuring out how do we bring you along for the ride? Um, how do we convince you that this is the right path? And so that was the realization for me was um, these people, like everybody, like if you're a developer, for example, and you go into some organization, you're like, wow, all those people like 10 years ago that wrote this software, like, are they idiots? Like, are, are they stupid? No, of course not. Like, they did things for the best reasons at the time that yeah. made sense in that context. And the context changed, right? And so it's the same thing. The context has shifted. So how do we help these people understand, like, we're here for the same why. The reason and the outcome we're trying to accomplish in most of these cases is exactly the same, which is how do we create a great customer experience? How do we deliver value more quickly and more consistently with high quality um, and what does it take to get there? Um, the what, the how is changing. And it changed from like it used to be heavyweight waterfall planning, lots of structured processes. Um, the thought was that's, that's how you know, it works so well in other places like manufacturing. We should just make it, be, it work in IT as well. Um, but that didn't work, right? The uncertainty is too high. The rate of change is too high. Um, the adaptability required to different situations is too high. And so we had to figure out new ways of working that could deal with those different sets of needs. Um, that's where we were able to um, really build that empathy. Because even inside a large organization, or especially inside a large organization, it's a spectrum, right? There's not like, it's not like everybody is hyper conservative or everybody is leading edge early adopter. There's hundreds of different teams. They're in all kinds of different 
places on the technology adoption spectrum, right? You've got um, some who are learning the latest and greatest stuff, whatever it might be. Um, maybe they were acquired in as startups, or maybe they just love technology and, you know, they're messing around with open source in their free time, whatever it might be. You've always got those people in every single organization. Um, and then you've got people on the opposite end who they have no interest in anything new ever, and they'll always say no. And so, you know, just like any, any change management initiative, organizational change management, you just have to figure out how do I find the people who would love to partner with me on this? How do I ignore the haters and uh, create some early wins and then start to bring the middle of that spectrum along for the ride? They're just, they're saying, you know, the middle of the spectrum is saying, hey, um, like that sounds cool and all, but like I'm not going to invest until I know there's value in it, right? It's not about technology for technology's sake. It's about technology or about process change because the value it creates. And so, you know, we partner with the early ones. We create some wins where we can show the value. And then we start using that and socializing that internally at like working groups, in our different um, chat channels, in internal technology conferences where we start sharing the value we have created, start sharing those wins, um, and then sharing the frameworks and tools we use to make that possible and using that as a way to bring people along for the ride. Um, like one example of this was uh, with uh, change management, ITIL change management, right? We had a we had its change advisory board. In fact, we had multiple change advisory boards meeting every single week to review some sort of changes. Um, and so what we ended up doing was I always like going back to the why and going back to the core of it, whether that's ITIL or whether it's like partnering with security, go back to like, why are they saying the thing that they're saying? Let's go find, in this case, the section in the ITIL guide that specifically says, here's what you have to do. In many cases, it's uh, it's sort of like the Bible in that people love to reference it, but they don't like talking about the context and the different interpretations around it. They often can't really cite any anything real from it. Mm -hmm. um, and so people use ITIL as a Bible, and the point that they'll be like, we have to have facts. You go back to the actual book, and they'll say, well, cabs are um, flexible. There's a lot of different ways to do sorts of change approvals. ITIL has something called like low risk changes. They have something called um, standard change. Standard change is like a magic phrase in ITIL world because it means every, whatever you're doing right now is pre-approved and you don't need to go to right? Because oh. it's a standard change, which mm. means it's supposed to be low risk. We do it all the time. We can easily do it. Um, that, that sort of thing gets applied to something like a password reset, right? You shouldn't have to like file a change request to reset somebody's password and go like wait for it to be approved. Um, you should just have your member of the help desk do it or ideally have it self-service. Um, and so we, we were able to apply those sorts of techniques to things that were like changes going through SCI to the pipeline. And so yeah. if it's going through this pipeline, it's well tested, everything is automated. Um, we will treat those as a standard change to be able to um, partner with the process ITIL group while also enabling the people who are able to move fast and adopt heavy automation to move faster with higher speed and at least the same level of quality. Okay. So that, uh, let me just play this back a little bit because I think what you just talked about is like this recipe for, uh, for that creating that bridge, right? Um, where you've got uh, anyone who's kind of trying to lead this type of transformation in their organization um, and, you know, bringing in sort of those de DevOps methodologies and, and maybe technologies with it. But, you know, I loved your kind of point about like, find the people who are going to love it and, and they're going to be with you, ignore the haters, and then you got to work on the middle. Um, but you got to create this, the win. So, um, uh, this idea of like, okay, you talk about your change management, you got to remember like it level set with everybody on the wise, right? It's for security reasons, for quality reasons, reference that sort of, Hey, this is, there is ITIL. We're just going to start to map what we're doing in a new way to all of these ITIL concepts. So things that are going to go through a CI CD pipeline, we're going to treat those like standard changes, right? To use the sort of the biblical reference, mm -hmm. right? Um, so, yeah, just I just wanted to like reiterate that, make sure I'm I'm getting it right because I think that's 
such a great example and something really concrete for folks to that idea of like, how do you bring, instead of just like, I'm going to, you know, uh, bad mouth everything I till and have a, ultimately probably a failed effort to transform because you haven't really embraced the people that are there. Instead, you're kind of like giving them a warm hug of like, no, it's, we're just, we're going to, we're going to do it, but we're just going to apply some new ways. It's all for the same reasons. Did I get that right? Yeah, exactly. Um, and like a, a huge piece of it was, you know, how do you, building empathy, how do you do the work to build the empathy yourself and build that bridge, right? And so for bringing the DevOps mindset, a lot of the work was you have to learn how to understand the ITIL world, mm -hmm. use, use their language, understand their processes, and then figure out how could you merge those two worlds together. You don't have to do all the figuring out necessarily by yourself. You can partner with them. But if you're speaking different language, right? Like, for example, with configuration management, meaning two completely different things. Yeah. Uh, or CI, meaning two completely different things, like you have literally no idea what they're talking about. You're just going to be constantly confused. Yeah. So the figure, you know, you got to figure out like, how do you bring those worlds together and help them move forward in a way that, um, that they are comfortable with and that you were happy about that direction. And everybody can have that shared vision of here's the future, right? We're still going to have to have these processes somehow or these practices. And I think that's the thing that's, universally true about basically everything in ITIL. Like yeah. go look through a list of, there's like 34 practices or something in, in the new V4. Um, and you look at those things and you're like, yeah, obviously any any IT department anywhere is gonna have to like do those things somehow. Like they have to have a way to respond to and resolve incidents um, and then fix the contributing factors. Um, they have to have a way to like, do financial management for their spending on vendors or cloud providers. Um, you can just not have that, right? And that, that's, you know, that's what I feel really has moved toward is more of you must have this practice instead of this is literally the step-by-step -step definition and process flow of how it must work. Yeah, okay, so I was about to say, I was like, what you're describing is like, I feel isn't telling you how you need to do it. It's telling you that these are the jobs to be done um in a way and yeah. like th the areas of practice so this is like this is the work to be done and and really it's a question of because everything you described before right it was like hey these teams that you inherited incident management event management configuration management like and the and the scenario of like hey this is this is where it came up it's like all of that for example you know selfishly thinking about like the pager duty operations cloud is like yeah we look at the events and then we help route them. And then we help make sure to call the right people, you know, on that schedule and, you know, even loop in customer service so they know what's going I mean, but the difference is it's all automated as opposed exactly. to something that is, there's a team that is just going through a carefully manicured spreadsheet and then manually punching in phone numbers and, you know, right. coming up with, answers that they can feed to customer support as like minutes and half an hour and an hour like clicks by. And so it's like just the name of the game is just speed with automation. Um, yeah. And that's, I just want to double down on that point too, because that's, it's such a good point around it, which is like, that's, that's the how, right? Like we right. had, is the shift really is um, a lot of the ITIL approach was we have a separate team of people. These people are like process people. And they sort of chase you around all these, all the product teams or service teams, or whatever. They're, ch they're chasing you around roughly with like clipboards and checklists and requests and like collecting information from you and entering it um, in this out of band process. And it's inevitably um, out of sync with reality, late and incorrect because the ownership is in the wrong place. Yeah. You get that ownership to be decentralized to each of the individual product teams that own builds and operates the service, suddenly you're starting to realign things in the, in the right sort of way mm. and also finding a way to keep them up to sync. Um, now the challenge, one of the challenges for us in this case was exactly that, it was the automation, right? How do you get that level of automation to happen? And so like we wanna do, um, I'll just go back to this, this change management example again. We want to do standard change with CSE pipelines. Okay, awesome. How do we create an audit record of every change that has happened to our production environment so that we can go back and 
identify which change caused the problem later. Um, that means that the CICD pipeline has to somehow be tied in to your master database of all of the changes that are happening, which is where the incident commanders are going to be looking to try and figure out something changed somewhere and yeah. some broke. Where? What is the where? Yeah. And then, get, yeah, I mean, that's just, and that's now, those are just change events, right, captured in PagerDuty, but it, there's all kinds of other automation that people might be trying to do. Um, and having that auditability is like, again, back to the process of like, this is the area of practice. You, right. need, you need this to be solved somehow. There's several different ways to, I hate saying skin that cat because it's really gory sounding. Um, but you know, paint that butterfly or whatever. Yeah. Um, and and like, so PagerDuty is a great example, right? Like, so you got the modern teams. They're using PagerDuty um, because so many people do. Uh, so then a problem comes up. They got their change record there. But um, the service desk and the customer support team aren't using PagerDuty. They're using ServiceNow customer service management or something like that. So how are, how are those two things tied together? How did they figure out that PagerDuty is there? Right? They have to have an, some sort of integration be able to tie things in enough without paying for like a light a license to everything for everybody to be able to say oh it's probably this thing now like chase that back to the right team and that right team is going to jump into the right software to do their job yeah um so okay so i wanted to come back you started to touch on like those or what's new in version four of itil and it sounds like it's sort of shifting away from Dictating that the the how these things get done involves you gotta have a team, maybe not specifying clipboards, but that's sort of what happens. Um, uh, but and now it's like, listen, it's just an area of practice, right? Which could be solved different ways. And I really liked your point about the ownership and sort of where do you shift the ownership? But this kind of raises a question of like, what then happens to those the, the teams that used to have the checklists and the clipboards. Um, and this is kind of a, like a little bit of a leading question back to the sort of the, the platform um, notion, right? But it's like, it, are those the teams that are, can, can they start to think about how do I do this in a platform way? Like where does, as that's all changing and becoming more automated, what, where do those people tend to go? Is it better to embed them in the in the product teams? Is it better to like use them as kind of hey, how do we think about things, um, but just in a, with an automation first sort of approach? Um, it, it really depends on exactly the people and like what their skill set is. Um, but I'm not going to leave you with that answer because that's not a very interesting answer to anybody. Um, so like, what you'll find in a lot of organizations is that most of these people are not hands-on technical people. And yeah. so you can't shift them into like a direct platform engineering role or something like that, where they're just focused on building this, these self-service platforms. Um, what really works well though, is they have been in this role of, you know, we'll just pick change management as an example. They've been in this role of running cabs and everything. Um, how do you, but now you want to decentralize things, move into peer review. And if you do that, it's going to speed everything up but you still need to find a way to make sure that whatever the process is, the user experience for that is really good. Um, the process is serving its purpose. It's continually being improved. Um, and there's some sort of governance in place um, to make sure that that process is working consistently with quality across every single team in the organization. Um, and so what I see working really well is taking those teams that were they were previously in the middle of the value stream for every single team. There were a central bottleneck. Yeah. Take them, take them out of hand and ship them into a backend governance sort of role where they're, they're moving more into policy up front um, and then into reporting and enforcement on the back end rather than being right in the middle. Mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you create a policy that enables self-service, that enables teams to do things really well um, and then create the right sort of um, data source and BI reporting that lets you identify teams that are really having challenges and partner with them to help them get better. Um, so like, for example, um, you know, we had, we had incidents at this company that were sub one through sub four. Um, sub one's like major incident, sub two was like, stuff is falling down 
really badly. We used to actually run those all as major incidents as well, but just slightly, like slightly less severe ones. And then three and four were just sort of like, oh, I'll no, rent somewhere. Somebody's going to deal with it, you know, in the next couple of days or whatever. Um, and so we were running these sub twos with our incident commanders who are, um, you know, highly skilled staff. Typically, they know like everything there is to know about the infrastructure where all the skeletons in the closets are, all the bodies are buried, to use more weird analogies, um, right? because they have to almost have that instinct for like what might be wrong somewhere because they mm -hmm. saw it once before. They kind of know the overall enterprise architecture, but they're not enterprise architects. Um, and so we wanted to figure out how do we take these sev two incidents and make them self-service so that an individual team or a self-organizing group of people could manage to get together to resolve that incident without having to make it a huge centralized thing with the process that entails with slowing things down even a little bit that entails to get things together, get them major incident communications um, really up and running, all that kind of stuff. Um, we wanted them to be able to self-organize, identify one or two people on these different teams, get together, work together and resolve it, right? Um, and so we put together something that was, it was no new technology at all. It was uh, documentation, mm -hmm. right? We put together a self-service incident guide for these sub two incidents and published it and did training on it and taught these teams, especially the ones that dealt with this most frequently, exactly what to do, all right? Set that expectation that like, hey, if somebody on like the 24 seven app ops team calls you up and you're on call, you need to pick it up even though it's not the major incident bridge trying to call you right now. Like you need to talk to them, like network team, app ops team, the two of you just get together, work this out, resolve it. Um, and don't you don't have to pull in the major heavyweight process that you do for something with the higher business impact of the sub funds. Yeah. Okay. Um, that's a super interesting and I think super relevant kind of example for folks, right? Who are, you know, if you're thinking about your your sub ones, anything that's kind of run through that major incident um, process is like that's your most expensive sort of. Mm -hmm process that you have to engage, but it's worth it for, you know, the right types of incidents that, you know, customer, you know, this is, this is affecting revenue and flight or whatever, um, uh, or lives are at stake or something, then yes, like do that. But yeah, how do you start to uh, transition sort of processes that don't need to be that? And so the SEV2 example, um, right. And so just to continue on that, because I, I had actually forgotten the original question and I'm yeah. going to come back to it. Right. So, so the question of that was like, how do you, so how do you decentralize the ownership, push mm -hmm. it out to all the individual teams, but then um, get the centralized team in a position of that governance um, and governance by being out of band. And so we pushed that out there, said we, we did the enablement side of the work. And then afterwards we were able to do the um, checking side of the work, right? Building in reports and saying, how does this affect um, things like incident resolution times for individual incidents? And how does it affect things like how long does it take to get the team together to start working on this problem? Um, did that change at all? Um, how does this affect um, the audience of the incident communications that are going out, right? Is, are they happier? Are they less happy, right? Because what would happen if you're starting up a major incident communications um, you are waking a lot of people up often um, inside of the company. You're like, hey, CIO, maybe CEO, like something big is going down right now. You should be following this. Um, and they don't want to hear about that for, you know, a small branch office off in Eastern Washington, wherever it might be. They want to hear about that for like the West Coast is down. Yeah. So this is actually really interesting timing um, uh, because what you're getting at in terms of that governance team that's working out a band and thinking about the policies up front that are like, hey, this is what's going to shape. It's, it shapes the automation, right? These are the things that, you know, we know want to go into the how of the, how things are going to get done. We want to make sure they're ticking these boxes and, you know, covering these bases. That's important. And then kind of bookended is being able to do that governance um, like, by, by sort of reviewing and analyzing and reporting on things. Perfect timing. I did not even, I did not know you were going to go here, but um, uh, I'm just going to put in for folks, this ties in with the new, um, some of the new analytics and reporting that uh, were just going out 
this week, I think. Um, uh, I just can't write and um, and talk at the same time. Um, but yeah, I just dropped in the, the YouTube link into the chat um, as where folks can go to just kind of catch up and just see exactly what um, uh, what's new. Cause it's, it's talking exactly in that where you can look at, Hey, let's look at all of our different services. Where are their hot spots in terms of we're having a lot more incidents over here? Where's there kind of like certain people are getting pulled in more often, like the sort of the responder mm -hmm. health, if you will, some people are being really overloaded and how do you then make changes on your team? Um, but anyways, the idea of just being able to have that type of data uh, about these types of processes so that you can do exactly what you're talking about, have those governance teams that are um, working on continuous improvement. So anyways, the timing was just really perfect. Um, I know we're kind of, we're coming up on time. I just wanted to see if there were any kind of final thoughts, you know, parting words, um, thinking about coming back a little bit to even just sort of the notion of your definition of like platform and, and what's successful there. I know that, that could open a whole new, um, you know, half hour conversation, but uh, it just, it seems like a good place to kind of bring things back to. Um, yeah, so I, th I think maybe a couple of parting thoughts, right? One is just to sort of, tie up the conversation on like, what, what is the ITIL V4 thing? Why should we care in one, right? Because all of your, if you're a vendor, all your conservative customers use it. So you have to understand what that means and where you're gonna fit into their world. You can't just pitch them on something that doesn't fit in. Um, integration is such a huge part of enterprises adopting new technology, you have to speak that language. Um, what does that mean for enterprises? It's like the V4 is, how do you bring in Agile? How do you bring in Lean? How do you bring in DevOps? How do you bring out a value focus instead of a process focus? How do you focus on the outcomes? Um, and it goes down that path. It doesn't go nearly as far as it could, but it goes a long ways down that path. Right? There's still a lot of um, vestiges of waterfall thinking in there, um, vestiges of like when they say customer, they don't always mean customer. They mean like the internal service consumer of something mm -hmm. you're building. And so it doesn't quite go far enough down that customer focus road where you start to have confused language and not really understand if you're creating customer value or not. Um, and they, you know, they like to call it uh, simple, but it's still like 34 different practices. So it's not simple, um, but it's, it's come a long ways in terms of moving things forward. Um, so that okay. world is catching up. Um, and now how do, we, how do we integrate with that world Right. A lot of that's building empathy. Um, a lot of that is, you know, how do we tie things in with the software and with the approaches as well? And that's where we come into um, platform engineering. Right? Mm -hmm. Like it's, it's being talked about a lot right now. I know some of your podcasts have already worked through it in some detail. Um, and I just wanted to share some of my perspective and, and a personal story on that, which is, you know, what, what we did um, at the same company. Right? I mentioned there's like a few different groups that I was leading there. Um, one of them was this group that... Uh, became a platform engineering group. They were like, they were called things like application middleware management and app application mm -hmm. middleware engineering and those those sorts of names, which are what a lot of um, older unreorganized enterprises call them. And, um, you know, we decided we need to do better. We need to move faster. How do we move faster? Um, it's not by us just working harder and trying to like resolve tickets that are requests for something more quickly. It's by um, exposing a self-service interface to our internal development teams so they can move faster. And so that came down to like three big things that went into what we called the DevOps services at the time. It was like a series of services like a CICD pipeline and a container service and a um, few other things. Um, and what the principles were that went into that really were, um, one was a platform operations approach. No surprise there, right? This is extending what exists, evolving what exists rather than inventing something totally new. Um, so things like running it with an SRE mindset, having SLOs, um, having platform automation, those sorts of things. Um, the second piece was self-service. Now this is, this is not an assumption internally. It is in the cloud world, but if you're on-premises, in many cases, you're still stuck in tickets and request fulfillment chains and like, can you please give me a VM here? Um, you know, can you please like provision a Linux OS onto my VM? Can you please like put your whatever enterprise middleware software onto the OS? No, that might even be different teams. Can you please open a firewall port? Maybe the security team then has to approve the port being opened. 
suddenly you're like 12 days later and you still don't have a VM with internet access. Um, how do you make that much more self-service, flip it around so that you have um, in the same vein, you have teams doing the policy definition that are centralized, putting themselves in the governance loop instead of in the value creation um, bottleneck. Yeah. So, you know, how do you do that? A lot of that is self-service. Put the smarts on the back end, but then to do that correctly and well, you have to have a platform as product approach, which is really the third pillar to me. Right? Okay. So platform operations, um, self-service and platform as product. And that is really about, you know, these teams that maybe you've got a principal engineer, maybe you've got a IT manager, a technical lead, like those people often have to take on um, the responsibilities of a product manager, which they're not familiar with and start learning some of these product management practices, like engaging with their internal consumers and actually asking them what their needs are, what their challenges are, what they see as opportunities for improvement. Um, maybe doing things like uh, creating a value stream map to understand the major pain points overall in some large process, like deploying a new application or major version upgrade is happening, right? What slows that down the, the most and how can you invest there? Um, so those to me are like the three big pieces of platform engineering. Um, we brought those to bear. We had uh, a ton of success with that internally. And um, a lot of the way we used to justify the investment was removing duplicative effort. Right? And so we'd say, hey, this is a centralized shared service. Every time we get one more product team to not replicate this, that is a net win of the total cost of that product team having built it and run it. Um, and so maybe we're saving some percentage of licensing or subscription costs, as well as some percentage of um, their time. And every single time we can multiply that in. So like in one of these services we had, um, I don't know, like 19 different teams using it. Um, and so we could say, whatever our cost is of build and run, we just saved 19 or 18 times that right. by having it exist. Um, that's, you know, inside of these, especially in an IT organization, right, the internal shared service group, driving efficiency is the main way you justify investment. Yeah. Um, that is super helpful. Uh, like, just to kind of reiterate for folks, those three big kind of guiding principles, platform operations, uh, you know, I wrote down SRE mindset and wealth of content out there to kind of get started on thinking about that self-service um you know that's obviously a, a huge one and a kind of a just as you said like a philosophical approach um and i like how you map that back to the idea of like that's about that's where having the policy up front as opposed to being in the actual stream of delivering value delivering it more slowly that is um comes into play and then finally like platform is product and um and sort of that kind of design thinking, I guess, kind of around um, what the whole experience is for those customers. Uh, and, and then I think yeah, that last point that you just touched on is really almost like, I would call it the fourth principle, which is, you know, how do you measure it and justify it from a business perspective? So, you know, your example, it's like every, every additional team that's on using it, like that is the incremental, like total cost of ownership savings that's coming in. So, I think that's super helpful. Thank you so much, Donnie. This has been just uh, like a wealth of information for folks. I've learned a ton, um, certainly about kind of ITIL, where, where it came from and where it's going and how people can be thinking about it. I think this opens up a lot of potential. So uh, for, for transform, that next wave of transformation. Um, so thanks again for joining. No, thanks for having me on the show. I really appreciate it. And I appreciate the, uh, the insightful questions that really deep into the heart of the issues and uh, kind of got me to open up. So thank you. Awesome. Okay. Well, folks, um, feel free to tune in tomorrow for uh, process automation 4.16. Um, next week, we'll be on the uh, AWS Howdy Partner Show um, with, uh, with a fun demo. And then we'll be back for another episode of the Unplanned Show on September 11th. Thank you all and have an uneventful day.